Yeah, salamat po. Um, my question is, um, I mean, perhaps you've heard the common quotation from the right-wing camp, uh, facts don't care about your feelings. And maybe you've heard that phrase before. Uh, now we know that uh, Christ uh, did not shy away from offending the religious leaders of his day uh, for the sake of truth. Um, in other words, the truth was more important to Christ uh, than people's sensitivities. Or you could say that the fact of the gospel was more vital to him than the feelings of his hearers. Uh, so my question is, how far can we use that principle uh, in the fundamentals of the Christian faith? Or how much should we care about people's sensitivities when it comes to the primary matters of theology? Does that make sense? <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with Ben Shapiro. And, uh, I have his book, and one of his books is entitled exactly that, uh, Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings. Uh, and that is, of course, true as far as the gospel is concerned and the teaching and instruction of scripture is concerned. We need to instruct, instruct in such a way that the truth comes forth very clearly and unambiguously to the hearers which will sometimes result in offending them if their position or practice are against what you are teaching there will be something that would be offensive but that's the offense of the gospel what paul says that we should be careful not doing first corinthians 9 19 and following is do not cause unnecessary offense, offense that is just cultural. That is why Paul was ready to make an adjustment when he said to the Jews, I became a Jew to those who are without law as though without law. But then he clarifies and qualifies by saying not without law to God, but under law to Christ. And he said the principle, I became all things to all men that I might save some. So I think what that means is that in matters that are cultural, not moral, uh, we are to be ready to make adjustments so that it will not add to the offense that is already present in the gospel. Because once you preach the gospel, it is already offensive to the self-righteous. It is offensive to the immoral. It is offensive to all kinds of people outside of Jesus Christ unless the Spirit uh, regenerates them unless the father calls them effectually uh, they would rather be offended than believe now my point is that uh, we must be prepared to preach the gospel in such a way that it challenges even to the point of offense their basic premises especially religious premises but let us not add to the offense that is already present in the gospel by being culturally insensitive. For example, we, we have a missionary in Thailand and he is careful not to do anything that would be offensive to the sensibilities of Thai people around him without compromising the gospel. And so with missionaries who go to uh, different cultures, they need to know the culture uh, so that they may not cause unnecessary offense. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Just a, a, a brief thing to add on that. Um, I think, you know, if, if our aim is we want to win people to Christ, we want to see souls saved, and we don't want to ruin our witness by being too bolshy, you know, too forward in our proclamation of the gospel, that we must be sensitive to people while at the same time having strong convictions on the primary matters of theology. Um, yeah, thank you, brother. Yes, I agree. And uh, we should be clear about the gospel and challenge where challenge is uh, appropriate. But again, there are areas of culture and uh, mere sensibilities that we do not need to transgress as long as we do not compromise the message of the gospel. Oh, 
from Dr. Ian. Uh, that was uh, excellent. And I agree just with what you have said. May the Lord help you as all to spread these great and glorious truths about the real worship of our unpredictable God. Thank you, Dr. Ian. And I do hope that you got the point. Uh, uh, all of us got the point that we are not afraid of the objection of being predictable because the real unpredictable one is God. You'd never know what God is going to do in any encounter of worship. And that should be the thing that should excite us. Go ahead, Mon. Pastor, question from the uh, live audience. Uh, first question, how should a Christian exercise liberty or freedom in worship without limiting God's presence and working during the worship service? Well, exactly by doing what God has commanded and then opening up the scriptures. And in this case, it is the preacher's main responsibility <clears throat> to preach powerfully and honest to the text and letting the text speak its meaning uh, to the point that it should touch hearts. And what I said we cannot predict, God will do is you never know what God is going to do in terms of perhaps of conviction of sin, perhaps it's comfort to the downcast. Maybe it is something which is just a refreshing insight of the truth. There is a host of options, if I may put it that way, for God to do, except that we cannot manipulate Him into doing anything that we want Him to do. Uh, in fact, God can even go beyond and against our comfort zone, as does happen during revivals. When there is a revival, as Jonathan Edwards described one in Northampton, when people would just uh, shout in uh, a mighty voice because of their rejoicing, or others just cry because of conviction, uh, that thing may happen to our church, and that will be outside our comfort zone of decency, and it is still God's work of revival. Go ahead. Follow up question for Pastor. Um, he says, uh, "Does the hymns uh, that is being uh, sing in the or sung in the church really uh, gives worship to God? What is the significance of the worship or of the hymns in the worship?" Well, there is to be singing clearly. The, we are told in Ephesians chapter 5 with its counterpart in Colossians chapter 3 that we are to sing spiritual songs, psalms and hymns. Uh, but by hymns, I do not think that is limited to the particular hymn book that we use. Uh, I have nothing against contemporary Christian songs that have good theology in them, such as in Christ alone. Uh, I do not limit myself to the classic hymns as the only proper way of worshiping God because those hymns are, many of them, a product of 18th, 19th centuries, which of course would not be, uh, technically speaking, uh, biblical in the sense that they are actual words of scriptures. I do not hold to the Psalms only position. So I believe there is a place for singing praise to God through our hymns and songs. I just do not believe that it is limited to a certain cut off period. Na before that, it's all good hymns. After that, it's all bad contemporary songs. Uh, I do not take that position. Uh, the main, the main measure of good singing of praise is theology, uh, the truth that is being sung. And then you also make measure of it by way of the, uh, the way it is sung, which is consistent with the message. 
for example, you are singing a song of repentance, and then you sing it in an upbeat music, uh, there will be a dissonance between the tune and the message of the song. So those things are secondary measures, but the primary measure still is theology. Go ahead. Uh, reading again from the uh, live audience. Thank you, Paul, again for the message, Pastor. Uh, what can you advise to a believer who stands on the regulative principle of worship but currently part of a sound local church uh, but is uh, on a non normative uh, principle of worship? Wala naman daw po silang drums pero normative yung worship nila. Well, that means you work for reformation. You don't immediately resort to separation. You work for reformation in your church, and the way to work for reformation is try to influence the leadership, especially the teaching leadership, uh, by giving them materials, uh, exposing them to... And there are good materials now, whether blogs or uh, audio, video materials that may influence them. And I know many uh, Christians who once had a background other than Reformed, who by their exposure to Reformed materials were also Reformed. So you don't immediately resort to separation, but you try to do a work of reformation. Now, if it comes to a point where there is such a resistance to any obedience to the Word of God to the point that it is affecting your worship of God and that there is a church uh, that you believe follows the scriptures more uh, the, in the right way of worship, then at a certain point, after trying your best to be an influence for reformation, but nothing happens, there is a point where you need to make a step of conscience. Question here. Um, uh, first, based on your preaching earlier, you had mentioned that we have been given the liberty to preach Christ, not of ourselves. So my question is, how can we warn those who preach their own intellect and not Christ? And second, how will I preach Christ to my Armenian friends? How will I share Christ to them biblically with liberty and love? So first, there's a question now. How can we warn those who preach their own intellect and not Christ? I do not really know what you mean. Uh, I believe that there should be an intellectual element in worship. And by that I mean something that addresses the mind, something that is challenging the mind, challenging the intellect. Now, if a person is only preaching his own opinion, and if that is what you mean, that they are preaching their own intellect, then that really is wrong. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, that uh, we preach Christ our Lord and not ourselves. And this is even an apostle speaking. So it must be the commitment of every preacher that the substance of his preaching is the meaning of his text that then sheds light on Christ. So every preaching should have something that displays of Christ. Uh, that should be intellectual but also expository and ultimately Christ-centered. Uh, but to preach one's opinion, uh, that is not preaching at all. How will I preach Christ to my Armenian friends? Well, don't begin with election or the absolute sovereignty of God. I always say begin with the gospel uh, because what you want first to know is that these people are true believers. Why? Because John 10, 27 tells us, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So it may be that you are pushing hard on election and you have all the arguments, but the problem is not that they're Armenian. The problem is that they are not even Christian. So that whatever you say, they are not sheep with ears to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I always advise in matters of reformation, uh, begin with the gospel. Who Christ is, what has he, had, what he has done. 
in terms of what I presented in the first session of substitution uh, on the basis of the condemnation of the law. So that's where you uh, try to win your friends. Not It's not an issue first of Calvinism versus Arminianism. It's always an issue of the gospel. Uh, what do they know of the gospel? This question again, if God con consumed those who went against the prescribed worship in the Old Testament, what are we to expect with those doing the same in the New Testament? If that is not happening today, what else can happen to those whose worship is not based on the regulative principle? Well, that shows what God could have done, but for grace. Because of Jesus Christ, grace even extends to those who are not worshiping God in the will, according to the revealed will of worship. So I'm not saying that the whole of worship of a normative principle church is rejected. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that that part which is not commanded by God is not accepted as worship. So why waste time? Why waste the energy for something that God would not accept anyway because He did not command it? And if you are there for God, you are not there to perform before men and women. You are there in order to be accepted by God. So there may be things that they do which are commanded by God, like they pray, they sing hymns, they sing new, they sing praise, uh, they preach the word, and as long as they do this with uh, a, with a proper focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that those parts of worship are accepted. But then when you begin to have other parts which God did not command, those parts are not accepted as worship. And it only wastes energy and shifts focus other than on Christ. Another question, Pastor. Masasabi bang tunay ang pag-worship ng isang Kristiyano kung hindi siya nakakapagbigay ng tithes or offering during worship service since uh, there is Christian liberty? Well, giving is not Christian liberty in the sense that it is a Christian duty. Uh, but <clears throat> how you give your offering uh, whether you do it lump sum in a month or you do it broken through every Sunday that is not something that we need to be to have scruples about but what is important is that giving is part of worship but make sure that it is giving before God <laughs> and, and this is one of the reasons why in our church, I, I do not speak for other churches, but in our church, we do not monitor giving. Uh, how much this, this has this member given over a period of time? Uh, it's between the Christian and his God. And if he's not giving as he should, he answers to God. How can he enjoy the gifts of God that are abundant and then be miserly? in the worship by way of giving. So, uh, in our church, we have had no real problem in terms of finances uh, as far as sufficiency is concerned. We're not a wealthy church, but as far as sufficiency is concerned, the people are well taught about giving without any close monitoring as to who are giving and who are not. Go ahead, the, this is uh, related to the question which was read earlier, Pastor. Should we completely remove the special number or when should we conduct special number? We're talking here of the stated worship of the church. They're gathering as the new covenant community of God which happens on the Lord's day. We're not saying that all special activity of music or songs uh, should be cancelled in any gathering of God's people. You have, for example, 
a gathering for someone's birthday or a wedding or some special activities in the church but not the worship of the church as a new covenant community on the lord's day we do have our own uh, music ministry in our church where we have uh, people who sing in special on special occasions uh, but worship you look at the reformed confessions the westminster the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationalists, the Baptist Confession of Faith, uh, they do not put worship only under the chapter on the church. They have a separate chapter on worship. Why? Because they want to isolate worship as that which is where God's prerogative should be most respected. This is God after all. And God has the right to require how we approach him. That's Isaiah 1.11. Isaiah 1.11 Isaiah 1, says, When you appear before God, who has required this in your hands? So even God is asking his people, when you appear before me as the gathered people of God, who required this? And that remains the binding question every worshiper must answer. Am I bringing to God what he has required? Because this is worship, and that's how the Reformed confessions have approached the matter. They isolated worship from other church activities because to them, this is the uh, highest prerogative of God that He alone must say how He is to be approached. Go ahead. Another follow-up related to worship, Pastor. Is it right to say that using drums and other instruments that are not prescribed or mentioned in the Bible is not acceptable to God. So that is similar to this question here. Are drums, electrical guitar, and other contemporary instruments prohibited to be used during worship or just the way they are played that which resembles secular music? So let us make a distinction. There is what is called the elements of worship and then the accidents of worship. By accidents, I do not mean something tragic happened. Accidents means just a matter of doing the essential thing. For example, uh, where do you sit when you worship God? A chair or a, a pews? Monoblock or soft cushion seat? I mean, those are accidents. They are not matters of worship. Worship is defined as that which is directed to God. Now, you are not directing to God the way you sit on a monoblock chair or on a cushion chair. It's not something you direct to God. But now when you hear the word of God, when you pray, when you sing praise, these are matters directed to God. That's, those are the elements of worship. And the elements of worship must be explicitly commanded by God in the New Testament. What then are the place of musical instruments? They are, they are aids to the real worship, which is what the voice of the people singing. So when an instrument begins to steal the attention, in other words, people can no longer hear the voices singing because the uh, the musical instrument is so loud and so uh, prevalent in the atmosphere of worship, then it is going beyond its function. The function of instrument is to help the voices of the people to sing the praise of God. It's the voices of God's people that are the element of worship, the instrument is an accident of worship. So I have nothing against uh, guitars as such. Uh, we began as a church with no other affordable instrument but guitar, but then we improved later on. Uh, 
uh, so those are matters of accidents, not uh, elements of worship. What can you say to the what can you say to reformed churches that does not include giving on their litur- liturgical worship? Utos po ba ito ng Biblia? Ay maliwanag na iniutos ito ng salita ng Diyos sa binang 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2 uh, every first day of the week uh, uh, we are to set aside what we are to give as Paul said as I directed other churches so it's not just a special case in Corinth but as Paul directed this is an apostolic direction to other churches so uh, I believe that giving should be part of the worship of the church now how you conduct the giving that's the accident uh, some would have an offering bag that is circulated around others would like to have something at the back of the church or at the front of the church that is where people can go to put in their offerings uh, those are matters of accidents but the element is the act of giving questions I'll just read pastor how do we strictly define obeying the prescription in worship if drums guitars and loud music or other event elements of normative music are not exactly prescribed what can we say about the use of media and technology such as microphones, internet, and live streaming? I already made the distinction between elements and accidents of worship. Elements are those that are directed to God. That's why we are limited to what God has commanded in the New Testament. What God has commanded in the New Testament is the central event of all is the preaching of the word and then there's the singing of praise there is the giving of our offering and uh, there is prayer and scripture reading these are the elements we have uh, clear commands in the new testament now the rest are accidents if they help those elements uh, we have loud uh, sound system because that helps the preaching of the word. So the sound system is just an accident, but it helps the element, which is the preaching of the word. The instrument is not commanded, but it is an accident of worship, but it helps what is commanded, which is the singing by the people of God to the Lord. So we must understand that if we distinguish the elements and the accidents, then there is no real problem as far as uh, those things that people will make scruples of. Hindi naman iniutos ng magkaroon ng guitar. It's not an element of worship. Uh, accidents are just helping the elements of worship. And remember our definition, the elements of worship are those that are directed to God because it's worship. And those elements should have clear commands of Scripture. The accidents are matters that would have to be uh, decided on by the church whether they help the elements of worship or they uh, become a distraction to the elements of worship. Go ahead. Any advice you can give in order to focus and concentrate in our worship to God? I'm sorry, again. Is there any advice that you can give in order to focus and concentrate to give worship to our God? Preparation is very important for the attenders. Of course, preparation for the preacher, uh, then preparation for the Worshippers, it is because of ill-preparedness that we come to church either physically unprepared 
and we are drowsy, inaantok, and the preaching becomes a lullaby to the hearers, and they use the church as an extension of their last nights. Uh, puyat sila nung last night because of watching TV, and they extend their sleep in church. Uh, these are well, ill-prepared people. Now, for the preacher, much has something to do with the preacher's preparedness to preach so that he will preach powerfully and with passion so as to be of use in the awakened uh, state of worship in the church. There's a question here about spending the whole day in church. AM and PM worship referring to the Lord's Day as a whole day. Well, that is how I understand. That is how the Puritans understand the Sabbath in their Reformed confessions. It is the Lord's Day. It's not the Lord's morning. Uh, it's the Lord's Day. And therefore, we give the day to the Lord both in the church as well as, may I say, in challenge, family worship. Uh, that's how the Puritans understood and practiced the Lord's Day. <clears throat> uh, I know the, the illustration is quite trite, perhaps uh, banal, but uh, it's still helpful. So if, say, somebody treats you to on your birthday to a pizza, and the pizza was a seven slices, and you were given six slices uh, and you insisted that the seventh slice should still be divided so that you get the other half. That's what some Christians are saying when they say morning service is enough. You've had your six days and now even that one day that you should give to the Lord, you still want to be halved. Just so you can have more for yourself. That's how, uh, that's how selfish it is. So my understanding of the Lord's day is to have the Lord's day, the whole day for the Lord. However you uh, spend it, whether from midnight to midnight or from sundown to sundown, as the Jews did. Uh, but the point is, the spirit of the command is spend the day for what is not the activity of the six days. Go ahead, Mo. Uh, is it acceptable to be creative in the way we stream our worship service in social media in order to reach out to the non-reformed viewers? Or is there any regulative principle that we need to follow even in social media? Of course, in, in the use of tech, no, I'm not a, I'm not uh, very literate in matters of technology, but I suppose that what technology does is it extends the worship of the church beyond the immediate environment of the assembly. And therefore, what the people should get is what they would have gotten if they attended the assembly of the church. Uh, this is just an extension. So do not make the extension the primary thing. The primary thing in the church is the assembly. And thank God we now have the assembly in full. Hopefully it will not go back to those days when we had percentages but we now have the full assembly. We should be thankful to God for that because that's the main thing. Whatever online participants obtain, they should obtain that which they would have obtained if they attended the assembly of the church. And here I think, I challenge the so-called new Calvinism. I rejoice in the fact that the Reformed theology is spreading and circulating. But this young, restless and reformed movement has taken one aspect, the doctrines of grace, but they would not extend the real reformation to that of worship. 
And what you have are a series of sad downfalls in many churches characterized by the young, restless, and reformed who have not followed the principle that the reason we worship is because we are free to obey the command of God centered on Jesus Christ. I hope that is what we seek when we worship. Thank you very much.